Welcome everyone, uh, my name is Krzysiek and I will talk about RX Swift tonight. My presentation won't be as short as, Antic, as Alex, but well, hope it will be entertaining as well. Uh, without further ado, what is RX Swift? So RX Swift is a port of a library uh, called uh, Reactive Extension to Swift. So yeah, that's, that's cool, right? We know everything now. Um, if you know what uh, Reactive Extensions are. So what are Reactive Extensions? These are the family of libraries that do implement the special pattern called observable pattern. And they're implemented in uh, multiple languages like <coughs> Java and Kotlin and Swift and many others and provide very coherent, uniform API to work with observables. So, what are observables then? The pattern consists of only two blocks. Uh, one is the observable, and this is something that gives data. Okay, this is quite a broad uh, view, but uh, it will make it for a while. And then there is also a second block called an observer, and the observer is just a consumer of data. And there's one, only one rule that uh, reactive extensions enforce on the implementation. The data has to follow some very special format. It must be in a format of uh, stream of events. So there's zero or more next events, and each of those next event carries some piece of information, and it has to be terminated either with completed event or with error event. So here are some um, samples of the good um, event, um, event sequences for observable. There might be, there might be some number of uh, next events and then completed, or a number of next events and then an error, or just an error or just completed. The important thing is after either an error or completed, so after termination of stream, nothing else is coming in terms of new events, or any events in that matter. Nothing else is coming. Okay. In Swift, it's modeled using the enums. Mm, the event is an enum, uh, which has three cases. It can either uh, be a next event uh, that carries some data, or error that carries error tab, or completed. And please notice that it is generic enum, it has a generic parameter, but only over the type of data that is being carried, not over the type of an error. Uh, and that's by design. It, it was made this way to make it uh, easier to compose observables. We'll see it later on. And then the observer and the observable are just in its basics modeled as protocols that are also generic, and they do have to match in terms of the um, data that they do expect. So if you do have an observable that emits or produces events with strings, let's say, next with strings, then you just cannot subscribe with an observer that expects ints, for example. Okay, why was an observable developed at the very beginning? So it was developed to provide a a coherent API that takes from three different concepts and try to unify them. So the concepts are the observer pattern, the uh, iterator pattern, and some things from ideas from um, functional programming. What exactly does it get from each of those? From observer pattern, the analogy is very straightforward. So in, um, in Coco, we usually map the observer pattern using, let's say, NS notification center. So this is uh, the source of events, and then we can subscribe using a closure or an object that is an observer. And uh, in observable pattern, in an observable pattern, we do have the source in terms of the observable itself, and we also can just subscribe an observer for that. Concerning the iterator pattern, uh, things get a little bit more complicated, but also a little bit more interesting. So. Each sequence type, which is basically something that can be iterated, uh, that you can 
uh, iterate on, uh, provides you with, a, with an API to pull the data out of a sequence. So you just pull it one by one, call next, 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 get another piece of data, another piece of data, and then after some time, it should terminate or not. And the observable is doing almost the same, but it changes one little thing. Instead of pulling the data, it pushes the data to you. So you cannot just uh, tell the observable to give you something. You can only register a callback and say, uh, execute this callback each time a new piece of data comes. So it's just pushing the data to you. Um, and this is actually exactly why we do have to model the data in observable in terms of a stream of events, because uh, it makes it uh, more or less equivalent to uh, the iterator pattern. And from functional programming, there were two basic things that were taken by an observable. Firstly, it provides a number of uh, declarative methods to work with an observable similar to those that you use to work with sequences like map and reduce and so on. And uh, also, it is designed to be easily composed. So the same way as you can compose functions or sequences in the functional programming terms, you can also compose observables. OK, so now that we know a little bit more about an observables, we can come up with a little bit better uh, definition. So an observable is something that publishes and transforms the events. And then observer is something that consumes those events. And if this sounds very generic still and really not specific to you, uh, it's good because this was designed exactly for that. Um, there are many, many questions that you can ask, like what thread is the data uh, generated on? Or how many events are coming? Or uh, where are, when are they uh, terminating? And so on. And all those details are under your control. So the pattern itself is very generic. All the implementation details are up to you. Um, from this perspective, knowing that it is, it is such a broad and uh, customizable, customizable pattern, uh, you can really think about an observable as a basic building block for the logic of your app. Just like the protocol or struct, let's say, are basic blocks for composing your code, and like UI view is a basic block for composing your UI, the observable might be seen as a basic block for composing the level, the, the logic of your application. OK, so this still might sound a little bit convoluted and scary. Um, how do I implement this logic? How do I use it? Uh, fortunately, you don't really need to implement a lot uh, or even at all, because the library provides you with a huge no amount of tools that are designed to work with observable. Uh, you don't really need to implement almost nothing from scratch, usually. And those tools come in the form of so-called operators. So Rx Swift provides you with operators for creating observables, for composing them, for doing some work with them, and for uh, binding them to the rest of your app. Let's, uh, oh, those, all those uh, um, operators are well, really well documented. Um, and most of the documentation comes with the, in the form of those uh, graphs, uh, marble graphs, and you will really grow to fond of them if you start using uh, Rx Swift because they are like the most descriptive way of showing what exactly is happening with each of the operators. So let's 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 just look at a few uh, examples of the operators. Firstly, let's say you want to create an observable. There are three basic ways to create an observable. You can create an observable for an existing object. So let's say you have an array. We already know that it's more or less the same. It can be um, seen as, a, as an observable almost instantly. So there is just a helper method called toObservable that you can call on your array, and you get an observable. There is also a huge number of bindings for the common UI um, elements like uh, text field or gesture recognizer or scroll view that will give you a callback, which is in the form of an event, each time uh, value changes, right? So there is a text field. Each time 
user puts anything into this text field or changes anything into the text field, you get an event with a new value. Um, and also, there is a lot of good wrappers around the common um, Coco libraries or you know, parts of Coco libraries. For example, let's say you want to make a network request, and it's a really good uh, case for the observable because you either get an error if uh, if uh, request uh, errors times out on something like this, or you get a value if 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 uh, request is okay. You just say Rx JSON and you get the observable out of that. If you want to have some special observable that is not provided by the bindings to the library, there's a huge number of templates or like a helper constructor methods that you can use. Let's imagine you want to have an observable that just emits an event each second, like a timer. There's no problem with that. You just say observable interval and it just gives you each second new event. Uh, let's say you want to have uh, an observable that just emits some particular element indefinitely. It never finishes. You can use that and uh, just by using helper methods. You can have something that uh, terminates uh, instantly uh, with an if either an error or a completed event. Or maybe you, you want to have some more sophisticated wrapper, like something that gives you a uh, an event each time a value changes for some particular variable. There is also a, a helper for that. If everything fails and you have no other choice and you cannot just think of um, making uh, any use of any observable uh, methods uh, that are provided by Rx Swift, Rx Swift, you can create your own observable with custom logic, but it is like almost never really needed. You almost never need to do that, seriously. Because it's way better to just combine the observables and get a new observable with combining some other observables. There is a huge number of operator for operators for combining the observables. Um, this site is a wonderful resource for uh, those um, oper operators, mostly because it's interactive. So there are just like small marbles that you can scroll around and change their position and value and so on and just see what happens, right? And by combining the observables, you get new observable that has some special characteristic like um, concat, when the first uh, observable terminates, it starts emitting uh, events from the second observable. Or um, combine latest, latest, each time Either one of those three observables gives you a new event. You get the sum of it because you, you specified it in a closure, and so on and so on. When you do have the observable that you want, you might use it to perform some work. So there is some data coming in the form of next event. And you can just make the, all the usual operations on this data. You can map it. You can filter it. Um, you can flat map it. There is something called, similar to reduce called scan. And there are many other methods just to performing some, um, some data, some data um, processing. And then when everything is finished, the work is done, you can just bind the observable data um, to your app, get it out of the observable by providing the subscription closure on a subscription object that will just perform any logic that you, that you want. So this is like a basic way of working with observable. Let's recap. Uh, first, Rx Swift is a library that provides you with an observable and observer and to a set of tools to work with them. An observable has to emit a stream of events, and the observer has to consume a stream of events. It was designed this way to combine some ideas from a few different concepts and provide a unified API for that. Mm, it can be seen as a very basic block that you can build your logic out of by combining and providing some custom uh, logic into closures and so on. And there is a huge number of operators that you can use to work with uh, observables. Okay, 
Now, let's not get very excited right now, because there is also another, another, a number of things that you can uh, go uh, wrong when you use Rx Swift. And in this section, I would like to just go through some very basic um, traps that you can uh, fall into when you are working with uh, Rx Swift. So, we developers, or maybe me uh, um, at least, are getting somewhat overexcited when we get new frameworks, because especially if the framework is a little bit complicated, because then we think, okay, it's probably just doing all the magic stuff for us, and it just provides you with all the work uh, that you do normally have to do yourself magically. But unfortunately, it's not magic, it's always code inside. So um, there is always some way of sausage to be made. So even if the sausage is delicious, you have to sometimes dive in and see uh, what's going on under. Let's start with memory management. I mean, we are not living in this wonderful world of uh, Java 8 that uh, Alec was talking about, where we have garbage collector and everything. No, we do have uh, work with Arc, and Arc needs some help to clean observables. Arc cannot clean observables by itself. Let's see an example. Here we have a tab gesture recognizer, and providing, doing, using this binding, Rx event, we can get an observable that gives you a callback each time that the gesture is being recognized, simply. And then we, oh, sorry, then we process it uh, somehow and add it to a view. And everything is cool and everything is good, but you can see also some special thing. There is a dispose back object and the subscription is added to dispose back. Why is that? Because each time you subscribe uh, to observable, so each time the subscription is being made using one of those subscribe next methods, both the observable and the subscription closure or object here is retained. It's retained. It won't, it, it won't deallocate. As long as you will not tell it to deallocate. And the most easy way to tell it to deallocate is just to use this helper object called dispose back. Because dispose back is an object which, which, which was designed only uh, to do one thing. When it deallocates, let's say you have a dispose back and somehow you deallocate it, um, then it releases all the subscriptions that were added to it. So those subs this subscription is retained. It will be a memory leak if you do nothing. But you have added to dispose back, and here is deallocated, and subscription is gone. Poof. Uh, and if you have a dispose back as a property in your class, let's say, then when the class is deallocated, the dispose back is also deallocated. So then the subscription is deallocated. And it's, it's, it's a cool way to, to work with that. Another thing that you might think it's totally obvious, but it's, it's not, apparently. Um, please remember to keep an eye for retaining uh, self in closures. Right? Here is a very innocent small line that just maps some method. Uh, added, it adds the method to an observable. But as we've seen, an observable is retained when someone subscribes to it. So if you return this observable and it has some method added to map, this home method, of course, retains self. So whoever is getting the observable out of this method, other method, it's just, he's just, um, well, he controls your life cycle or life cycle of your, uh, of your class now. So please remember, until it's a very good idea to do otherwise, always weak self in closures. I mean, you can, you can work around it. You, can, you don't have to do it. But please understand whether it is OK or not OK to do that. OK. Enough with memory management. Uh, the second trap that you can fall into is um, working with asynchronous execution. Actually, it's. It's not, uh, it shouldn't be a really big source of confusion because Observables has a really clean um, architecture of working with asynchronous, uh, with uh, multiple threads. So it's usually, it's often used to do uh, asynchronous operations. 
OK? Let's see an example. There is a network call. There is some network client that returns an observable. Uh, and this observable is just created because you've made a request to a server, right? So you just ask some shared session. OK, this is singleton. Maybe that's good. Ne never mind. You have an observable here. And it executes somewhere in some thread. Um, then you change a the thread and say, OK, now I want to do serialization, but I want to do it in a special place. I have prepared this thread called serialization thread, let's say. And then I want to return what's, what's, what's been done. And here is the consumer of, consumer of this API. And he, when he gets the observable, he wants to bind the data to the UI. So he just ensures that it will be a binding, will be executed on main thread, because you shouldn't just touch UI from not main thread, right? And um, well, we do need to change those threads from background to, sub, to uh, uh, main thread, because observable is single threaded. So it's always single threaded. So there's only one thread at a time that a particular callback is executed on. And only one particular uh, thread is being uh, used to work by an observable at a single time. However, this thread can be uh, freely changed and can be, can, be, can, be, can be changed as you want. There are three types of threads that you can think of in context of observables. First, there's a declaration thread. And the declaration thread is just a thread that you do call your subscribe method on. So the observable is created, nothing happens until you say subscribe to it, right? And then in this thread that you call subscribe method, it's your first thread, first important thread, declaration thread. Then there is a generation thread, so a thread that the events are being generated from the observable. And you can either get it from the template method that you use, for example, network, um, session Rx uh, JSON um, has already some idea what thread does it want to execute or generate uh, events on, and it doesn't let you change this thread. Some other methods does change, let you change this thread, and if there is nothing baked in, let's say, in the, in the observable, you can use a subscribe on method to change that. And then you can choose, uh, you can change the threads freely using the observe on, and Actually, you can just call observe on as many times as you want. Each callback can be called uh, on different threads changed by the observe on methods. So there are only four rules to determine which thread is a particular callback executed on. If nothing else is specified, it's a, it's a declaration thread. So when the, the thread that you called subscription method on. If the generation thread is baked in into an observable or provided by you, then both the generation and all the works is done on generation thread. If there is already generation thread baked in and you want to change it, you cannot. Only the first one uh, is, 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 uh, is valid, let's say. And then there's no limit on changing the uh, work threads. You can just do it whatever you like. OK. Another thing that can be a little bit um, convoluted, it's state. And usually you don't have to think about state in terms uh, when you work with observables because observables are stateless by default. So they only keep the information that you have provided uh, by closures. However, it gets a little bit tricky when you try to use multiple subscribers to a particular one observable. Um, here we have some service that provides us with uh, data and we want to bind it to two different UI components, right? So um, both some um, data label and some navigation title wants to so display the username. And if you, and you have to use the special operator called show replay to uh, be sure that each, for each of those subscriptions, all the work done here in provide user uh, name is uh, done only once. And you want to be sure about that because this work can possibly include some network requests or some fetching from database or something like this. Um, observable doesn't 
cache events. It has no buffer by default. So if you do have a very simple observable and you tell it just uh, generate one, event, one uh, data event and then perform some basic operation and subscribe multiple times, for each of those subscriptions, you will get both generation and the work done uh, each time, right? So, so it will get done multiple times, and you possibly want to avoid it. And then show replay makes it that for first subscription, the work is done, and then show replay say, OK, I will keep a buffer of one, so of only the last uh, event that was generated. And then for each subsequent subscription, I will use this buffer. So then only one, uh, one time uh, the work in the uh, closure is performed. And there's also a number of other operators to work with multiple subscription. They are more or less uh, under the family of connectable observable uh, operators. So you can, you can really perform a lot of custom logic Concern, uh, concerning the multiple bindings. Okay, the last trap I wanted to talk about is readability, because this is a very uh, common mm, complaint from developers. Yesterday there was a post from a very well-known uh, Cocoa developer, Brent Simmons, which is uh, widely recognized and mm, uh, a very, a very uh, wise guy. Uh, who is not really a fan of uh, reactive programming, and he, he uh, uh, said something like this, that there, is a, there was some inflammatory language about the readability of uh, uh, reactive uh, programming and Rx Swift in, in particular. And I can actually sympathize with this view, because somehow when there is a new library coming, people, instead of assuming that all the good practices that, you've, that they've been working uh, with before should apply. Uh, they just think, OK, this is a new tool. Let's just throw away all the good practices and use it like we have just started coding yesterday, which is, which is, which is wrong. It's just simply wrong. Um, so please don't really re read this example, uh, because this is only about the code volume. We have learned to extract logic from big objects like from forever. Like there was a massive view controller that everyone was talking about for two years. And we have always seen and heard and read a number of posts and presentations how to extract things from uh, big classes. So if you see something like this, like there is an observable and there is a closure which is that big, it is just plain wrong. It is just an opportunity for refactoring. So each time you see something like this, you can probably extract all this logic into a separate function. And as long as you keep your closures, the work that you do, uh, like one, two lines long, it will be way more readable. It will be way less source of confusion. Uh, also, there is another thing. This is part of solid uh, principles. I mean, what is the responsibility of an observable? The responsibility of an observable is to provide you with a data flow, right? So there is some data coming in, and there is a number of operation, and then data goes out. So this is a responsible, uh, responsibility of an observable. And it shouldn't really be a responsibility of an observable to contain all your logic. It should be just something that expresses the data flow. Also, there is a number of patterns, or let's say mm, commonly used uh, operators that come in, in groups that you can easily extract out. Uh, the, the example is something like this. You get an observable with some data that you want to show in the UI. So first of all, you want to ensure it's uh, been executed on main thread, because this is UI, right? And second of all, you want to be sure that it never errors out, because you don't really want to bother your UI code with thinking about what happens when the error comes. You just want to show some default value. Uh, and because this is such a, such a uh, common thing, and also uh, sharing the, the, the work, this is such a common thing to have those three um, characteristics for an observable, 
Rx Swift provides you with something called driver that is just an observable that has those three things baked in. So instead of just saying catch error and then observe and then share replay, you can say just give me this observable as a driver. And it will ensure that it's always on main thread, that it's always sharing work, and it always provides you with some default value in case of error. OK, so let's recap. There are four common problems that, can, that you can come across when you're working with Rx Swift. Memory management, you have to do that because Arc won't really help you if you won't help Arc. Um, then identify the threads because uh, you want to really know what thread is the block executed on, usually, especially if you're touching UI code. Then know when to share work. If there are multiple subscriptions, there is a good probability that you want to share work. So think about that. And also, don't forget the good practices that you've been already using just because you're using your library. So now that we know what an observable is and maybe how to use it without shooting ourselves in the foot, I would just want to finish with some broader view on why the observable and the idea of an observable is useful. It's a very useful, in my, um, in my opinion. First of all, observables really scale. You can use them in your app with a varying degree. So you can just use it in one particular place, like let's say your networking code. It's usually asynchronous, and there is probably some number of operations that should be done one by one. So instead of callbacks, just use an observable. It will be much uh, readable. Uh, then you can think about just using it for all the asynchronous operations, not only networking code, and maybe then for driving UI, some binding to UI, and so on and so on. And it will work in all of those scales. So it is, it is a really it's a really nice library to, um, to both just uh, try and to use it as like a cornerstone of uh, your app. Then the observables expresses data in terms of pipes, right? So um, if you have seen the presentation from WWDC 2014, um, advanced iOS application architecture and patterns, there is a whole big section about how to express the data flow uh, throughout your app in a most uh, readable and coherent way. Otherwise, it's just a best opportunity to provide some spaghetti code. So observables are great for that, because the data source is very well defined. You are sure that nothing else executes this uh, logic is apart from the events coming from this data source. And then each logic is done step by step. You always know what the, what the um, order is. And then you always know where are the points of connection between the observable and the rest of your app. So this is a really, really good pattern to uh, expressing these data pipes. Because it is also so generic and customizable and non-specific, you can express a lot of different concepts in terms of observable. So let's take optional, because this is a simple one. Uh, each time you would return an optional, you can just return an observable. And you can just decide whether when there is a value in an optional, OK, you will just return a, mm, a next event with this value and then completion. And when there is nil, you can either just return the completion or return an error uh, because there is a nil. And there is also a number of other uh, concepts that you can uh, express the same way. So each time any of your method throws something, you can, instead of throwing, just return an observable that will either give you a value or return an error that will be thrown. Each time that you return a sequence type, you can return an observable. Because, which has very simple, uh, very similar API. Uh, there are wrappers in Rx Swift for uh, common cocoa patterns like uh, target action or KVO. So we can just use them directly, right? So a number of things can be expressed in terms of observable. And why would you do that? Why would you do that? Because when you do have everything expressed in the same uh, API, you can compose things very, very easily. And when you, try to, uh, when, you, when you start to use it more and more, 
after some time, you will find that naturally more and more of your functions and your methods are either consuming observables or uh, returning observables. So this is some kind of like a uniformity over your API that makes it very easy uh, to compose. And because of that, I can really see an observable as some kind of like a statically type Swifty ID type. Uh, you, are, you are probably remembering the ID uh, type from Objective-C, which, which was just a type that had no information about itself, right? So you can just call any method on it. Any message could be passed to an ID type. And observables are not just like that because, well, they do have some generic type as a parameter. You have to be sure that you compose them uh, in a good way. But because they encapsulate various concepts uh, behind their uh, uniform API, you can just compose them more or less the same way that you have used to compose um, the ID uh, type in Swift, in, in Objective-C. So, of course, there is one drawback, uh, the one that a lot of people were uh, the, the one that was the reason why a lot of people were trying to avoid ID type in Objective-C, which is you don't really know what's happening inside, right? So you don't know uh, whether it's uh, synchronous or unsynchronous and so on. Anyway, even if you don't want to let the observable be like the basic building block for your app, there's also another good reason to just try it. Because reactive extensions were ported to so many languages and to so many platforms that if you understand the concept once, you can more or less use them in very different uh, contexts. So you can e use them either on the server side or on or the mobile platform like Android, or uh, you can use them in a web client. So the concept applies everywhere, and most of the API is the same. And also, the last thing to encourage you to try Rx Swift is a very is a really developer friendly library. Um, the guides at the uh, reactive uh, site are awesome. There's a huge documentation. And uh, we can always dive in into the source code. It's open source, of course. Uh, there's a huge number of extensions. So each time you think about writing some special custom logic for, let's say, uh, wrapping some uh, additional UI component in a uh, reactive way, there's a good chance that it's already been written in the React uh, Rx Swift extensions. And there is also a very friendly and huge community. Uh, I do encourage you to check the Slack channel. The, there are more than 1,000 people there. And there's always someone ready to help if you have a question. So let's just recap. Um, observables can be used only a little or a lot. It depends on you. They unify various concepts, and they really can simplify the data flow uh, throughout your app. If you have any troubles uh, to get the particular operator or some special uh, functionality of uh, the Rx Swift, please check the docs, which are awesome, and also consult the community, because it's uh, very open and very uh, inclusive. OK, so uh, that's all. Thanks a lot, and uh, we have time for questions. Have you encountered any computing on the runtime problems uh, on the slower CPUs uh, on the older iPhones, maybe? OK, so the, the, the question was basically about the performance, right, of yes, uh, observables. I, I was using Rick Coco, uh, and I had a problem with the table views. Uh, with binding the data, uh, observe, observing it, and binding it to the UI. OK. So uh, I have not come across those problems. I mean, I probably have just never used it in such a context that it was performance intensive. Uh, for the simple bindings uh, for, uh, in, in, a, in a table view, it was enough. Yeah, I never had uh, big problems. But I can easily imagine that they could be some. If so, well, probably you just have to jump out of an observable and do some work, let's say, like on the, on the side, and then pr maybe just mm, get back into the observable afterwards. I can, I can imagine situations when, when, it's a, when it is a problem. Uh, however, yeah, for m most of the cases, if they are not performance intensive, I think it, it should be OK. Yeah. There was some other question. Is 
the disposable pattern that you mentioned in the very fragment optional or, or needed for absolutely all cases? Okay, so. For example, mm, when the stream completes, perhaps. Uh, yeah. The disposable pattern, is it always uh, required? It's not always required because, uh, yeah, when the stream completes, the resources are deallocated. The thing is, uh, and there are also two other ways, at least, to dispose of a subscription. You can just call dispose on a subscription, and or you can use the special uh, uh, Rx deallocated operator for, a, for, a, for an observable. So it, there might be a situation where you don't need that. And if you are really sure that this is one of those situations, there is nothing wrong with just uh, ignoring the, the whole uh, disposing problem. But uh, yeah, so, so, so there are some ways of just ignoring the, the possible warning that comes out of that and uh, just uh, letting the, the um, resources be deallocated the way the, 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 the they are deallocated naturally with the end of subscription. Uh, however, there is also nothing really wrong with adding it to a dispose bag, and I think that, um, let's say, imagining the flow of, imagining how the app uh, will um, behave in terms of deallocation is easier, for me at least, if I don't need to really dive in into uh, thinking about whether this particular subscription will end before some event or after some event and so on, right? So this is, this is basically why I think that this post back is, is such a useful pattern because it makes you think of uh, disposing of this observable in the same way as you can think of deallocating any other uh, object in the uh, Swift world. So, so it's kind of a good practice because yes. Yeah, yeah, it's explicit and also, yeah, and also it makes it more coherent with the other, uh, with the other uh, object that you that you allocate and deallocate, right? Do you use uh, Rx with your commercial uh, projects in Portland, for example? Oh. So the question is whether uh, Rx uh, was used by me in a, in a production apps, and yeah, I've, I've used it in one production app. And I had no problems, although it wasn't like a very big project. So, yeah, but uh, it's definitely production ready. Uh, there is a huge number uh, of uh, of success stories, both in terms of iOS um, apps and also in terms of other platforms. Like it's very po very popular on Android, uh, mainly because there is this uh, retrofit library on la Android that. Uh, uses uh, R Rx Java heavily, so the whole library has definitely been used for a long time in production. And we, and we have uh, some projects in uh, production on uh, Oh, okay. So it's good, it's safe to use it. Cool. Yeah, there's a question in the back. Unfortunately, okay, so the question is whether I can compare Rx Swift to Reactive Coco, and unfortunately not, because I have only like played with Reactive Coco uh, during the Objective C days. I didn't really like it then, mostly because it's not really that um, readable in the Objective C world for, from my perspective. Uh, and then when Swift uh, became popular, I just jumped into Rx Swift. So sorry, but I cannot really say much. It doesn't have less stuff, but more. Yes. And uh, I don't know whether you will agree or not, but I think that like the most concepts are very easily translated between both yes. two, right? Yeah. Okay. So any other questions? If not, thank you, thank you very much.